Boeing's Starliner capsule has docked with the International Space Station for the first time, notching a huge milestone for the aerospace giant and its quest to fly NASA astronauts to and from orbit. Starliner lifted off atop a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station Launch Complex 41 on May 19, kicking off a crucial uncrewed mission to the station, called the Orbital Flight Test 2. After a four-and-a-half-minute burn, the Atlas V booster powered by a Russian-built RD-180 engine separated, and the Centaur upper stage took over. Another six minutes later, Centaur shut down, and Starliner ultimately separated from the rocket a bit less than 12 minutes after liftoff. During the spacecraft's orbital insertion burn, which occurred 31 minutes after liftoff, two of Starliner's thrusters didn't fire as expected. The first failed after one second, and its backup immediately kicked on and was able to fire for another 25 seconds before it also failed. Redundancy failsafes activated a tertiary backup for the thruster group, and Starliner was able to complete the crucial burn without incident. About 22 hours later, Starliner began zeroing in on the ISS, performing a series of flyarounds, approaches, and retreats as the two vehicles flew 436 kilometers over the South Indian Ocean. The spacecraft docked with the forward docking port on the Harmony module of the station at 12.28 a.m. UTC on May 21. The docking took place more than an hour later than the original schedule, as controllers worked through several minor issues, including the spacecraft's docking ring. At around 4 p.m. UTC on Saturday, astronauts on board the International Space Station opened the hatch of the Starliner spacecraft to unload over 180 kilograms of supplies and provisions, and pack its hull with nearly 270 kilograms of cargo, marked for return to Earth. The story of Starliner's orbital flight test campaign began on 20 December 2019, when an uncrewed prototype of the Boeing spacecraft first attempted to launch to the space station atop an Atlas V rocket. The spacecraft's mission events timer caused problems almost immediately after spacecraft separation. The timer was not properly set, causing it to fire its attitude control thrusters at the wrong time and consuming too much propellant to permit an approach to the station. The anomaly forced NASA and Boeing to cancel the planned docking with the station and land the spacecraft two days later. The mission was again set to launch in August 2021, but scrubbed just hours before launch when pre-launch checks revealed 13 of the 24 oxidizer valves in Starliner's propulsion system were stuck. It took about eight months to identify the cause of the problem and remedy it. Now, more than three years after SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft first safely reached orbit, and almost two and a half years after Boeing's Starliner crew capsule's ill-fated launch debut, Boeing has finally managed to reach orbit and successfully dock with the space station. The Boeing Starliner has an innovative weldless structure and is reusable up to 10 times with a six-month turnaround time. The vehicle comes in two main parts, a 4.6 meters wide reusable crew module which carries the astronauts inside, and a service module that provides power and propulsion. The capsule and the service module are attached to each other from launch until shortly before re-entry. The capsule was designed to accommodate seven passengers, or a mix of crew and cargo, for missions to low Earth orbit. For NASA service missions to the International Space Station, it will carry up to four crew members and scientific research. The OFT-2 Starliner capsule is scheduled to depart the space station on Wednesday for a return flight to Earth, ending with an airbag softened parachute landing in the New Mexico desert. If the mission is completed without significant issue, Boeing's next priority is Starliner's crew flight test, a crewed launch debut to the ISS that could happen before the end of 2022. NASA's InSight Mars lander is gradually losing power and is anticipated to end science operations later this summer. By December, InSight's team expects the lander to have become an operative, concluding a mission that has thus far detected more than 1,300 Marsquakes and located quake-prone regions of the Red Planet. The information gathered from those quakes has allowed scientists to measure the depth and composition of Mars crust, mantle, and core. Additionally, InSight has recorded invaluable weather data and studied remnants of Mars' ancient magnetic field. InSight, short for Interior Exploration Using Seismic Investigations, Geodesy, and Heat Transport, landed on Mars on 26 November 2018. Equipped with a pair of 2.2 meters wide solar panels, the lander was designed to accomplish the mission's primary science goals in its first Mars year. Having achieved them, the spacecraft is now into an extended mission, and its solar panels have been producing less power as they continue to accumulate dust. 
When InSight landed, the solar panels produced around 5,000 watt-hours each Martian day, enough to power an electric oven for an hour and 40 minutes. Now, they're producing roughly 500 watt-hours per sol, enough to power the same electric oven for just 10 minutes. Additionally, seasonal changes are beginning in Elysium Planitia, InSight's location on Mars. Over the next few months, there will be more dust in the air, reducing sunlight and the lander's energy. While past efforts removed some dust, the mission would need a more powerful dust cleaning event to reverse the current trend, such as a dust devil or a passing whirlwind. At the current rate power is declining, InSight's non-seismic instruments will rarely be turned on after the end of May. The team will soon put the lander's robotic arm in its resting position, called the retirement pose. It will keep using the seismometer to register Marsquakes until the power peters out, likely in July. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Elon Musk recently gave Tim Dodd the Everyday Astronaut a tour of Starbase. The 45-minute video is jam-packed with intricate details of numerous updates and optimizations SpaceX has made to Starship and Super Heavy Booster. One of the improvements is to use ullage gas from the Starship's propellant tanks for orbital maneuvering, rather than separate cold gas thrusters. Elon Musk describes the changes as one of the most significant improvements to Starship. So it's, it's, a, it's a significant optimization, mass and cost savings to use the ullage gas for um, attitude and reaction control than to have separate cold gas thrusters. Technically, ullage is the space inside a propellant tank that is filled with gas rather than liquid. Due to microgravity, the cryogenic liquids inside the tank will be in a slushy state of liquid and gas when the rocket's second stage is coasting. If ullage gas is sucked into the engines in this mixed state during engine restart, it will displace useful propellant, reduce efficiency, and potentially damage the engines. As a result, to prevent a mixture of liquid and gas from entering the engines, the ullage volume must be kept away from the inlet that leads to the engines. To prevent ullage gas from mixing with the propellant and entering the engine's combustion chamber, some spacecraft utilize what's called an ullage motor. They are relatively small and independently fueled rocket engines that will be ignited in a zero-g situation to accelerate the rocket before the main engine ignition. The resulting acceleration causes the liquid in the rocket's main tanks to settle towards the aft end, ensuring uninterrupted flow to the fuel and oxidizer pumps. SpaceX is planning to use autogenous pressurization to force liquid propellants to the bottom of the Starship tanks. In autogenous pressurization, a small amount of propellant is heated until it turns to gas. That gas is then fed back into the liquid propellant tank it was sourced from. This aids in keeping the liquid propellant at the required pressure for feeding the rocket's engines. According to Musk, SpaceX is planning to use this comparatively warmer ullage gas for the orbital maneuvering thrusters instead of having separate cold gas thrusters. SpaceX can avoid installing cold gas containers on board Starships in this manner, reducing the overall weight of the ship. This correction was made in response to everyday astronauts' question to Musk during his previous Starbase tour. On the booster, we actually have uh, quite a lot of ullage gas, basically a lot of gas in this thing, yeah. um, and uh, which we would have to actually just vent to vacuum anyway, because right. it's, it's got too much gas, yep. and that's just extra mass that you don't need. Right. Using the ullage gas to vent, then you don't need uh, you don't need a separate hot gas thruster system. You don't even need a cold gas thruster system. You already have hot gas. But this is only for the booster, right? Yes. Um, although arguably, now you mention it, we, should, we, should, we, might, we might, might be wise to do this for the ship too. Another design optimization SpaceX is planning is on the forward flaps of the ship. According to Musk, the flaps are in the wrong location in the wrong size and far from optimal. He claims that even though not optimized, the flaps will do their job, but there is a potential scenario where SpaceX can completely eliminate the forward flaps. There's a, a potential scenario where we can delete the forward flaps entirely. SpaceX's director of Starship Launch Engineering, Joe Petrelka, also appeared in the interview to discuss how much better Booster 7 is compared to previous prototypes. According to him, the newly added booster chines will catch more air when the booster re-enters the Earth's atmosphere for landing on the tower arms. The chines, that are 120 degrees apart, will increase the overall wetted surface area of the booster, resulting in more drag when the booster falls back to Earth. Musk also stated that they are working to optimize booster grid fins and that the booster will most likely only require two or three grid fins, similar to the 2017 interplanetary transport system design. 
Uh, it's also, there's like, we obviously don't need four. Like, I think we could probably get away with, with two, definitely not more than three. During the interview, Musk confirmed that SpaceX intends to launch Booster 7 and Ship 24 for the inaugural orbital test flight, and they are planning to test a deployment of some Starlink satellites during the flight. The Starship orbital stack, according to Musk, will take off quickly due to its high thrust to weight ratio. Starship orbital stack is going to come off the pad very fast. Yeah, it's got a high thrust to weight. I mean, it should be like 1.4-ish, maybe 1.5. He also reiterated that SpaceX still plans on catching Starship with its massive chopstick-like Mechazilla arms on re-entry. According to Musk, SpaceX still has a lot of improvements to make with the ship and booster design, but right now, the company's priority is to get Starship into orbit. He emphasized that there is a high probability that this first orbital flight will fail. Musk also revealed the Starship's Mars mission plans during the interview. According to him, SpaceX aims to reduce the cost of bringing a ton to the surface of Mars from $1 billion to $100,000, a feat he calls insane but entirely possible. The celebrity billionaire has shared a lot more information about Starship and Starbase in the interview with Tim Dodd. Don't forget to watch the full interview on Everyday Astronauts channel if you haven't already. I'll provide the link in the description. The construction of the first Starship orbital launch pad in Florida inside the gates of Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center is rapidly progressing. As of May 21, SpaceX has installed three of the six orbital launch mount legs. The inclination of the legs appears to be slightly lower compared to the launch mount legs at Starbase. This will most likely be a design optimization implemented by SpaceX based on the experience gained from Starbase. SpaceX has completed the first five sections of the Starship Orbital Launch Tower at Kennedy Space Center, and teams are currently working on the sixth. Spaceflight now reports that members of NASA's Independent Safety Advisory Panel recently expressed safety concerns about SpaceX's plan to launch Starship from Pad 39A. According to the panel, there are obvious safety concerns about launching the large and unproven Starship vehicle so close to the pad used for crew missions to the ISS. This, in fact, is one of the many reasons why SpaceX previously dismissed the idea of launching Starship from its existing launch facilities at Space Launch Complex 40 and Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. Now, let's move on to the updates from Starbase. SpaceX has begun installing Raptor version 2 engines on Super Heavy Booster 7 inside the Mega Bay after the prototype completed a range of ground tests. According to reports, it's highly likely that SpaceX will install a complete set of 33 Raptors on the booster before beginning static fire testing. SpaceX could have started testing Booster 7 with only one or two Raptor engines to reduce risk. But it appears that SpaceX is in a rush to complete the static fire test campaign as soon as possible. However, it's unclear how long it will take SpaceX to install all 33 Raptors, build a heat shield around those engines, and complete the rest of Booster 7. SpaceX has also begun filling the tank farm's horizontal methane storage tank with liquid methane in preparation for the upcoming static fire testing. Inside the high bay, adjacent to the mega bay where Booster 7 currently stands, SpaceX is working on Starship 24 that's first in line to take a right on top of Booster 7 into space. SpaceX teams recently installed the ship's forward flaps. Booster 8, the successor of Booster 7, is also being assembled inside the high bay. SpaceX teams had recently installed the methane transfer tube, or the downcomer, into the oxygen tank section of Booster 8. Booster Quick Disconnect Plumbing Shield, which will protect the QD plumbing and electrical lines from the flames during a Starship launch, has recently been delivered to the launch site. The shield will be installed over the QD plumbing soon. The orbital launch mount shield, which will protect the fuel lines and other launch pad systems from the Raptor engine blast, was also recently delivered to the launch site. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.